I'm going to start off today, and I'm going to read 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17. This is what it says there. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. All Scripture, it includes those hard-to-comprehend passages of Scripture. It includes the things that maybe make us uncomfortable when we come in contact with Scripture. You know, those books of the Bible like Leviticus, like Lamentations, Song of Solomon, and just about every single one of the little minor prophet books. If all Scripture is from God, and it is incredibly valuable for us, then we need to be very serious about studying all Scripture. Okay? This passage gives us actually four reasons why all Scripture is profitable. The first one it talks about is for teaching. Okay? God's Word, it instructs people. It reveals God and God's heart so that we have access to the mind of Christ. You understand that? This is beautiful. God does not want any of us playing a guessing game. He doesn't want us to know, well, I don't know. What does God really think about that? No. We have something right before us. God has put down into writing all that he wants us to know. The second thing is reproof. Okay, maybe your translation uses the word rebuke. It's a similar idea. God's word, what it does is it exposes our sin. It brings to light and actually it puts a giant spotlight on our sin. Okay? So let's be very obvious and very honest. That right there is not always comfortable. A lot of times we're reading through Scripture and then God's like, oh, uh-huh. And you're like, it's so much better when it's about other people. <laughs> or we kind of like limit it and it's like, well, he's talking about the Israelites. It's clearly not my problem. Hmm. We'll figure that out in my thoughts. No one really likes the worst of ourselves on full display. It is not something that we really like to see. The Bible talks about us seeing our natural face. It takes that obvious look first. And then it comes down to how are you going to respond when you see yourself? Is the Holy Spirit going to change you? Or are you going to stay and walk away and be like, ah, there really wasn't anything there? God's Word this is something that really it is scripture. It shows us our sin. It shows us our shortcomings. And it shows us that we all have an insurmountable need that only our Savior can meet. Which leads us into the third one. Correction. You understand there is only one solution to our problem of sin. That's it. There's not many solutions. It is just simply one. And I am so glad that Scripture, it doesn't just reveal my flaws and my failures. It doesn't stop there. It corrects. It's right there in front of us. God's Word, it reveals that there is hope and help in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Okay? Blatantly, publicly, let me just share this with you. If you are struggling with anything, I want to tell you there is hope and help in Christ. Christ and the Holy Spirit changes us. We look through this in James. All of Scripture testifies to this. We are grabbed a hold of. And from the inside, God does something massive. Radical change. And then from that place, everything outwardly changes. But there is correction. And the fourth one is training in righteousness. This is 
the positive and practical application component. It is, what do we do with what we know? It implies actually regular and continual growth by reading and being exposed to and being under the teaching of God's Word. From Scripture, we learn what is true. We learn what is wrong. We learn how to correct the wrong and how to apply the truth. That being said, when I say that we are about to begin a study in the Minor Prophets, and I for one am super excited, you might be a smidge resistant. There might be aspects of you that are a little bit intimidated, because we're just not awfully familiar with these verses and these uh, passages. There could be a little bit of apprehension maybe welling up inside us. Because it is a little intimidating. You know, most believers, they have at best only glossed over the minor prophets. Many of us don't really dig deep into this because we chalk it up to, ah, that's for a different period of time, and maybe we're not that familiar with it. By and large, we have neglected these 12 books because most of them, if we're very honest, aren't easy to read. And maybe it's even hard at times to see the relevance to today. So let me share my prayer. Part of the reason why I have said, okay, the next passage, as I was praying about it, Lord, we're finishing up James. Where are we going? And he was like, the minor prophets. Okay, Lord. Okay. My prayer is this. I want to see this study, which we're going to entitle Messengers. I want to see this, and it is truly going to help us to see these 12 books with God's eyes. A little bit of a fresh perspective that these books are not distant. They are not things that we cannot relate to. Just because they are thousands of years ago does not mean the same heart-level things that are going on in each of these books are not similar things that we have encountered, that we can identify with and maybe at some level struggle. Well, we're going to be going through these books, and we're going to do it in a different order than they appear in Scripture. Right? It's not going to be... This is the exact order, because the truth is, I didn't want to, um, <laughs> but they're not in chronological order. Okay? Sometimes when we read things, it's like, I like to start at this date, and I like to go through. I'm not saying I'm going to do all of them in chronological order, either, so don't do that. But we're going to do them in a little bit of a different order. order. But as we tackle each book, May God use our time to ignite more of a passion to dig into these books. We will never be able to do these justice in our little bit of time, but my prayer is that it whets our appetite. We're going to find each of these books incredibly relatable, and I am very, very, very confident <coughs> that God is going to use them to teach us, to rebuke us, to correct us, and train us in righteousness. But before uh, we get into any specific book, I think it's important for us to understand the overarching timeline and chain of events. So today we're going to kind of give like a little bit of a helicopter view to things. And we're going to start at the very end, and, and I loved as we opened today that we got before our eyes Malachi chapter 3, and kind of the heart of what is going on. But at the end of Malachi, which is recorded about 397 B.C., God's people, they are under the thumb of the Persian Empire. And despite a revival during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, where they ended up seeing the temple rebuilt, they saw the walls rebuilt, and they saw the people dedicated or rededicated back to following and serving the Lord. Only a few decades later, 
an unmet expectation seems to kind of deflate and derail God's people. Here's the thing. They had sacrificed to God. They had put their own interests on hold. They had put God first. And, and religion was once again a, revere, a revered type idea. This was something that was exalted. <coughs> Yet, as they've done all of these things, and they put all that effort into it, God had not delivered them. God had not followed through on his end of the bargain. At least so they thought. The initial zeal it had morphed into mere outward complacency. Religious practices were still being regularly offered, but the heart had again drifted away from God. The people, especially the religious leaders, they had excused away their behavior. They cross-compared, and truly they felt comfortable. Following the prophecy of Malachi, God, he was silent for 400 years. And what that really means is not that God did not move, because he was doing incredible things setting the stage. But God being silent meant that God stopped communicating through the prophets like he had. The end of the Old Testament, it seems pretty grim. God's people are wayward, and God's promised Messiah had not yet and so as I kind of put myself into their shoes, and I try to kind of go, okay, what would life kind of feel like? What would be things that are going on in my head? This train of thought, it gets me to ask the question, how did we get here? When the Bible opens, after Adam is created, he is found walking with God in perfect harmony in the garden. That's a pretty far stretch from what's recorded at the end of the Old Testament. So again, how did we get here? That's going to be the title of today's message, How Did We Get Here? And we are going to go through and trace the Old Testament timeline, which is going to actually truly prepare us for our study in the Minor Prophets. But before we do, let's pause and pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for your moving. I thank you, Lord, that you have never once stopped, stopped being active and invested in all aspects of this life. Lord, even in the period of time where you were silent, so to speak, Lord, that you were not communicating through your prophets, it's clear that you were actively at work setting the stage. Help us as we kind of get a little bit of a glimpse, and I pray, Lord, that you would challenge us mightily today. Lord, this is such an exciting launch-off point. And so, God, I pray that you prepare our hearts to be open, to be challenged by your word. Use us as you see that. And we pray this in your precious name. So let me start off by saying, I believe God's Word in its entirety. Okay? At this church, what we do is we stand upon the authority and the supremacy of Scripture. In layman's terms, what that means is, if God's Word says it, we believe it, we stand upon that, and we're going to preach it from this pulpit. Beginning in about 4,000 B.C., God created, in literally six days, He created all that we know. This culmination of creation, it came to man and woman. And when they were created, not only was all of the creation without sin, and said, that is all good, but that is also the situation that man and woman Regrettably, mankind, we rebelled, and we chose to sin. And this pattern, it did not stop. In Genesis 6, okay, we're going to spend a lot of time in Genesis, so flip over to Genesis, it's the first book of the Bible. Genesis 6, I'm going to read verses 5 through 8 in just a second. But in Genesis 6, God, he calls Noah to build an ark. And all of mankind, as he's looked over it, they are absolutely wicked 
to the poor. This passage, it describes the condition of man's heart. And so, here it is. This is what it says. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth. And he was grieved in his heart. The Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land. From man to animals to creeping things to birds of the sky. For I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Wickedness abounded. Sin was everywhere. It was such an ominous cloud, and it wasn't just superficial. The wickedness, it steeped right to the core of man, and every thought and every intent of the heart was continually evil. You could say man rebelled and chose to sin over and over and over. Following the flood, God, he blessed, and he gave the command to go and fill the earth. Mankind, unfortunately, decided to stay and build the tower. That's recorded in Genesis 11. So flip over Genesis 11. First four verses. It says in Genesis 11, Now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. It came about as they journeyed east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. They said to one, one another, Come, let us make bricks and uh, burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone, and they used tar for water. They said, Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven. And let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise, we will be scattered abroad over the face of a whole earth. This is a sad testimony. God gave them a very clear command, and unfortunately, man chose to rebel and choose to sin. Roughly 2020, or sorry, 2200 BC, you start to see a man in chapter 12 arise by the name of Abram. God chooses Abram, and God tells him to go. It is actually going to be through Abram, who is later Abraham, that God is going to bless not just his nation, but the entire world. However, there are some interesting things that happen along the way. Instead of arriving and residing in the promised land, Abram decides to relocate because of famine. This was not God's command. But it also didn't seem like God immediately objected to this. This is what it said. I want to read the accounts. So turn over to Genesis chapter 12, the next chapter. I'm going to start in verses 4 and 5. And I'm going to read just a little bit there. This is what it says. So Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him. And Lot went with him. Now Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took wife, uh, Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his nephew, and all their possession, possessions which, had, which they had accumulated, and the persons which they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan. Thus they came to the land of Canaan. Okay, so far, so good. We'll continue on. Abram passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem to the oak of Moreh. Now the Canaanite was then in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Okay, and still, everything up to this point is really good. Abram, he had arrived at the correct destination, and God says, this is going to be all yours. Okay? We're tracking. Next couple of verses. 
Then he proceeded from there to the mountain to the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. Abram journeyed on, continuing toward the Negev. Okay? Just to give you a point of reference, you may not know this, the Negev is still part of the land of Canaan. Okay? It just so happened that this was a, de a desert region that was typically very challenging to cultivate. And that is just before any type of famine hits. This is just a very arid, very challenging, very hot, lowly water type region. And so it's hard to actually cultivate. And if famine is to sweep in. And sadly, this is where the story takes a pretty bad turn. Verse 10. Now, there was a famine in the land. So Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn. For the, for the famine was severe in the land. You know, this seems like almost a random factoid. Maybe almost like it's an afterthought. But the truth is, God gave a very clear command. So let me ask, do you think that the famine was something that God did not know about? That this was somehow not part of God's plan when he says go and be there. Abram took it upon himself to leave the land because of the famine. Just because there are no <coughs> immediate consequences when we ignore God, it doesn't mean that there won't be consequences. Eventually, as the book of Genesis ends, Abram's descendants... They are back, and they are in Egypt now. They're slaves. They are slaves for 400 years, under great oppression, eventually. In about 1,500 B.C., God uses Moses to lead these people out of slavery. Along the way, the Mosaic Law is given. Now, the Mosaic Law, it consists of 613 laws that are there to regulate life and worship for the Israelite people. And this law, it was basically a conditional law. If you obey, God will bless. I want to give you an interesting little um, adjustment that under Jesus is made. It's completely turned around on its head. It's no longer, if you obey, God will bless. And this is ultimately where a lot of people get mixed up when it comes to a relationship with Christ. It's not, if you obey, God will bless. It is, we are incredibly blessed in Christ. Therefore, we ought to obey. It's flipped on its head. Sadly, again, the Israelites rebelled. And they choose to sin. Eventually, Israel, they desire to have a king. Instead of being this holy nation that God called them to be, one that was completely set apart from every other nation, they were to be a display nation. Instead of all of that, Israel says, No, I want to be like the other nations. I want a king. And in about 1050 B.C., they select Saul. To be their king. Saul, if you know the story, he rebelled and he chose to sin. So God gives them a man after his own heart, the little shepherd boy David, the one who wrote most of the Psalms. Here's the thing about David he starts off great. Man, the guy's life was phenomenal. But eventually he gets comfortable which leads him to incredible depths of sin. And he too rebels and chooses that path of sin. Then in, in 970 B.C., the wisest man to ever live arrives on the scene. That's David's son, Solomon, and he takes the throne. And God tells Solomon, he says, do not multiply wealth, women, or war horses. Don't do it. It's a bad idea. And unfortunately, Solomon, and even the greatest wisdom, he rebels. And he does the exact opposite. 
He ends up multiplying wealth, he multiplies wives and women, and he multiplies war horses, all relying on himself. This leads to the nation of Israel splitting in two. And you got the top, okay? The northern tribes. This is composed of ten tribes. And these northern tribes, they are called Israel. And over the history of their life, they have 18 kings. And it's really easy to track Israel's history because every one of those 18 kings were awful. They were bad kings. There was selfishness and idolatry, and it was running rampant everywhere. And in 722 B.C., Israel is taken captive by the Assyrians. Okay? Then you got the two southern tribes. They're called Judah. It's actually Judah and little brother baby Benjamin. Those are the two tribes that kind of broke off. They have a total of 20 kings. They have 12 that are bad and 8 that are good. But the 8 that are good are the reason that they are prolonged. That they don't suffer the immediate fate that the Assyrians coming in and captivating, uh, capturing the uh, 12, the 10 northern tribes occur. But unfortunately, in three waves, the Babylonians, they come on in, and finally, in 586 B.C., everything is destroyed, and the people are entirely removed. It is during the dark days of the divided kingdom where most of the minor prophets minister. The ones that don't, it's Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. These are the only prophets to write to the returning remnant after the captivities. But the continual theme of rebelling and choosing to sin, it rears its ugly head over and over and over again. Every one of the minor prophets saw that same nasty, rotten, selfish, prideful, wicked heart. I want to share another little interesting tidbit. Have you ever wondered why Judah was in captivity for 70 years? I mean, it is a fulfillment of prophecy, but why the total number of 70 years? As I did research, this is what I came to find out. It's fascinating. Maybe you're here today and you've heard of what is called the Year of Jubilee. This was instituted by God back when the law was given. In short, the way that it worked is Israel, they were to work, and they were to till the field and cultivate the field, and they were to do it for a total of six consecutive years. And then, God was telling them, you need to rest for one full year. So six years you work, on the seventh, you rest. And at that point, everything was to reset. All debts were to be expunged. The land was to be returned to the original owner, and the land itself physically was going to rest. To accommodate for taking the entire year off, God was going to doubly bless year six. And so year one happens, things are good. Year two happens, things are good. Flash forward, you get to year six, and God doubly blesses. Things are great. However, when year seven rolled around, Israel never stopped working with you. They ignored God. And for a total of 490 years, Israel never once practiced the year of Jubilee, completely ignoring God's command. Now, I did the math. Maybe you're following me. That is a total of 70 disciples where the land never rested. God said enough is enough. You understand God cannot and God will not be mocked. And for 70 years while Judah is in captivity, that land finally got its rest. So how do we get here? God gave clear instructions to man. And man rebelled and chose to sin. God rose up individuals throughout history who were tasked with the responsibility of pointing people to repentance. 
Yet the wandering heart of man was always in the background, either excusing away sin, ignoring sin, justifying sin. Again, the cold heart is God cannot and He will not be mocked. Just because it appears like you might be getting away with something, or like God is somehow ignoring your dabbling in sin, understand it does not mean that God is turning a blind eye to that. These messengers that we're going to be looking at, these 12 books of the Bible, these men, they were sent by God with a wake-up call. Pay attention. Heed God's warning. Turn from your wicked ways. Repent before it is too late. I want to tell you, the solution was always before their face. Flip with me to 2 Chronicles. We're going to close with this passage. 2 Chronicles, towards the beginning of the books of the Bible, in the Old Testament. Chapter 7, verses 12 through 16. This is what it says. This is after Chronicles. Chronicles. It says, Then the Lord appeared to Solomon at night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. If I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people and my people, who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. And I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer offered in this place. For now I have chosen and consecrated this house that my name may be there forever. And my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. What an incredible promise. Unfortunately, by the time we reach the end of Malachi, what we end up seeing is the glory of God had left the temple. That's recorded in Ezekiel. God's people, they were so distracted by their religious pursuits that they didn't even know the Holy Spirit had left. So how do we get here? In short, blind eyes, stubborn hearts, and substitute passions. As we embark on this study, I want to leave us with a little bit of a challenge. This study of the Minor Prophets, it is going to confront areas in our personal lives, and it is going to challenge us. Let's just stop for a second. Let me ask, what if every single person in this room we genuinely prayed to God and we committed to humbly address all areas of potential concern. When I think about revival, true revival begins with God's people being serious, really, really serious about their relationship with God and truly what God values. Although you might at times feel like you are 10,000 miles away from God, you understand that you are only one step away from restoration. That's what this passage in 2 Chronicles talks about. Sometimes we're in these places where we see all of these circumstances and God is trying to say, Yo! Wake up! Stop it! Playing around. Pay attention. My word matters. And he gets our attention, but it's just for a second. 
and we get comfortable and we fall back into all the patterns that we've already created in life. It is my prayer as we study these 12 books and we are confronted that we hear that call. That if there's areas in our life that are not conformed to the image of Christ, that we would take that serious. Because here's the truth. God grabs us. He brings us into a right relationship with Him, and that is only done through Christ. So let me start there. I do not know if everyone here knows Jesus as your personal Savior, but the gift is extended to all. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That is the truth and the foundational building blocks of the gospel. Jesus came, fixed what you and I broke by our sin. Okay? And the moment you accept that free gift of salvation, positionally, that never changes. You are forever his child. He loves you, and even though you will continue to make wonders along the way, God sees you through his eyes of God. He sees what he has done and what he has provided on your account. And his righteousness makes you clean. That's how that works. But then, as a believer, there are times in our life where it just seems clunky. Where there's things where we just don't get it always right and we make a mess of things. You're only one step away from restoration. That fellowship, it's there. It's not because God ever moved why that fellowship feels distant. It's not. God has been there the entire time. It's kind of like part of the song. If you find yourself and you're asking yourself, how did I get here? It's just like the prodigal son. You don't have to stay there. You're not, you're not cemented in that spot. God calls you to himself. Are you listening? Humbly return to the Lord, repent of anything that needs to be. And as this passage promises, God hears you. So the question is, will we listen to God's word and will we listen to his messengers? This is something I am very excited about. As I've dug more and more into the minor prophets, I am absolutely convinced that God is going to use this in our church's life. And just so you can kind of whet your appetite with me, next week we are going to embark upon the book of Obadiah. That is not only the shortest minor prophet, it is historically probably the very first minor prophet on the scene. That is what we're going to look at next week, and I pray that the Lord will continue to challenge us with His Word as we study this. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank You for Your truth. I thank You for the hope that is woven through it all. Well, the truth is, at the end of all of this, it didn't stay disconnected. Lord, 400 years after the minor prophets, you broke onto the scene. Lord, that birth, the nativity, Lord, the Son, Emmanuel, God with us, coming to this earth as a baby. You did it for a purpose. You came to seek and to save that which is lost. You came to remedy what we broke. To restore what our sin kept us forever distant from you about. Now through Christ, there is hope. We do not have to stay broken. Lord, there is a relationship that is offered to all who accept. And that grace that you have come and extended, Lord, it is free for all. Help us to see that. Help us to receive that. And then help us to live in light of that. Thank you for all that you have done. And we thank you.